Uh, we start with a question with, uh, to Dr. San Miguel on the salvage treatment. Uh, in a specific uh, patient, uh, which is uh, the sequence you would uh, uh, follow? Let's say one patient is starting with NTT, the other one is starting with NPV, which could be the sequence of treatment you would adopt in that patient? Yes. As I have mentioned, I think it's important to make the right decision at the time of relapse to have the compass. And uh, this is critical because there are just four issues. One was what type of drug do you use? And sometimes pay, uh, uh, doctors forget that, that alkylating agents are part of the myeloma treatment. And they are treated with the fancy drugs, but they forget the alkylating. The second is the efficacy of the drug for how long you had been uh, with disease control. The third point is the comorbidities and the toxicity induced by the drug. I mean, if, and you need to have these four points in front of you in order to make the decision. Because what is easy is to say, okay, now let's move. I have started with MPT, move to Velcade, but pr probably the patient has a peripheral neuropathy already and you cannot move. And if the patient has received MPT and for a short period of time, let's say nine months and has enjoyed a prolonged period of time, this patient is clearly a candidate to be retreated with an imid. Then I think my formal recommendation and the most important message is that to keep in mind these four cardinal points will help a lot in order to make the right decision. Absolutely agree. Some comments from the panel? I think I agree with uh, what you said, Ivan, but uh, I just want to mention that uh, in the, rear, in the uh, future we may need to change a little bit our way of uh, uh, managing our myeloma patients. Uh, based in uh, your and the other studies uh, with MPR plus R, you can see that we may need this rather maintenance or the consolidation phase after the first line therapy for uh, patients with multiple myeloma. And this is a real issue mainly for the elderly populations. We may have patients who are frail also, and uh, we need to know what will be the maintenance result in this specific uh, population. We know that the nalidomide is a very good drug after MPR. We don't know what's happening if we have given MPV or NTT initially, and then we have the nalidomide uh, maintenance. So I think that uh, as uh, we have new results for uh, elderly patients, we have new results for uh, uh, transplant patients with maintenance phase. I think that we have to keep in mind that maintenance may be needed in such patients and what is the best drug, uh, of course, we have to discover. So. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Uh, in one of my uh, slides, I suggested that in patients that, for instance, are on maintenance with a single agent, let's say lenalidomide, if they have biological progression, you could add a corticosteroid that you can control again the disease. And this comes from, the, the, from two data. One is the smoldering. In the smoldering, the biological progression under lens maintenance has been clearly controlled with the addition of a corticosteroid. And also from our experience with thalidomide cyclodex. And I think for the elderly, this is a, another important message. In, the past, in Spain, we have used thalidomide cyclodex for a long period of time. And our policy was as soon as the patient has disease control with a plateau phase for more than six months, we take out first the cyclophosphamide, then we took out the corticosteroid, and we keep on very low dose of thalidomide. When the patient starts to progress, you add the uh, corticosteroid, and eventually you add the cyclophosphamide. I mean, this type of managing, I think, could be also something to to think in mind for the elderly fragile population. Absolutely, I agree. Uh, in this uh, setting, it's very, it's very important, uh, especially in the advanced stage of disease, to keep the disease under control instead of having a response. And from this point of view, that modulation of one drug is not enough, I add the corticosteroid is not enough, I add an alkylating agent, or on the other hand, on the other way around, I can take some of them. If I just to mention uh, one other thing that uh, uh, I think that we have to make, uh, to take into consideration also the cytogenetic profile of the patients, even in the elderly patients, because you know that the more aggressive disease we have, then uh, we may need uh, more treatment.
quickly to our patients even if they are frail. May I ask you to the panel, I have two questions first. One was the, we had a question uh, during the beginning of the presentation, which is in your opinion, uh, the toxicity rate that we should have in our regimen and therefore the, discontinua the discontinuation rate. We are on the 10% discontinuation rate, is acceptable 30% discontinuation rate, is acceptable 30% toxicities in a given regimen, or we should have something less. Well, zero, please. zero is the best. Well, yes, <laughs> but. <laughs> but I mean, you, you already mentioned that 30% is something which is acceptable in the trial design. But uh, when it comes to reality, um, the, for instance, in the VISTA trial, uh, in the continuous part of the VISTA trial, the discontinuation rate dropped. So we are really looking for something below 30%. So in my opinion, the first selection, 10% was my selection, but I think the panel will discuss this. I, I think it's a matter of debate. I mean, I, I think we are stuck with the 30%. Something that will give us uh, a lower discontinuation rate, I mean, it's the better for the patients. Uh, I think that discontinuation rate has to be related with the success rate. So if we do accept that the less discontinuation, the more success we have. So we, we, we try and look for less discontinuation. As you've shown in the slides in the previous presentations, that as a matter of fact, giving lower doses because it came to less discontinuation in the end of the day, the success was higher. So 30% for now is acceptable, but definitely my choice was 10% too, and that was because there was no 5% choice anyway, so. <laughs> can, can I just add one thing? And in, in, in my point of view, it's also important to, to keep in mind which type of toxicity you are dealing with. For instance, if a patient is hospitalized because of a pneumonia at the beginning of the treatment, and uh, so the pneumonia is treated and this was related to neutropenia or, or the dexamethasone. Well, it does not um, necessitate a switch for a treatment. You can go on with the treatment, give some GCSF, give eventually some antibiotic prophylaxis. So it becomes quite different if your patient has a grade three neuropathy which necessitates treatment discontinuation and then the patient probably will suffer from that side effects for a longer period of time. Yeah, I mean, you, you're quite right. It, it's more important than discontinuation is the reason why we discontinue. And, and yeah. reversibility. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, but yeah. if I can, uh, can uh, stay on the argument, uh, high dose DEX is increasing the risk of infection versus low dose DEX. So how would you discuss this issue? You can give the antibiotic prophylaxis and the other issues and try to give with the maximum dose. So. I think we are learning how to deal with protocols. In the uh, Turkish MPT trial, we were lucky because we were very much influenced and we learned a lot from your own experience and for instance, use of low molecular weight heparin and use of routine antibiotics were what we implemented in our trial and the discontinuation rate dropped. So by time we learn how to deal with agents and we manipulate and we increase the, uh, the things that um, you know, combat with the toxicities. I think that this is very important to know uh, how to deal with the new drug that we have. Everybody, I think, uh, needs the best uh, efficacy with the lowest toxicity. And you have shown that uh, uh, lowering a little bit the dose of botetanil, meaning every week, then we may have the same efficacy with lower toxicity. It is, it is probably the same with lenalidomide because, um, okay, it is one of the drugs like thalidomide that we have fixed dose for a patient who is 40 kilo or 100 kilo, so we have a fixed dose of the drug. Maybe we need to change that and maybe with lowering the dose as you have shown, we may have the same efficacy with lower toxicity. So I think that we continue to learn uh, of how we can uh, handle the new drugs. You give me the opportunity to ask the next question for the panel. At this point, in your opinion, uh, which is A, the definition of frail, very elderly patient, and B, if I can, in your practice, uh, once you define that that given person is a frail person, which is uh, the regimen and the dose of uh, uh, agent you use in that person? 
actually, if I can start, uh, we have also shown that we have uh, benefits with uh, the new agents uh, till the age of 75. That was a study that was published by the Greek Myeloma Study Group in Leukemia. So we continue to see uh, an, an overall survival benefit till the age of 75. And after this age, then we have problems. And the main problem, we, we haven't seen any uh, survival advantage. So just cut off is 75. 75. I know that in U.S., uh, some people... That in, well, some people in the U.S. may say 80, so this was one of you would we've vote seen for that 75. Even, we've seen that even after the age of 75, we haven't seen any survival advantage, and this was mainly because of the toxicity and the discontinuation rate uh, if we use the standard doses for this uh, specific cohort of patients, because uh, this study includes patients outside of clinical trials, so with the recommended, with the licensed uh, drug dosages. So we haven't seen any survival advantage in this cohort of patients. So above the 75, and of course, frail, I think uh, we define it as a patient with uh, comorbidities like, uh, as you mentioned very nicely, renal problems, heart problems, uh, diabetes, hypertension, that uh, uh, makes um, the toxicity of the drugs to be even higher uh, than when we don't have these side effects. So regarding what we, we give uh, for such patients, um, we, to be honest, we, outside of a clinical trial, we give MPT in uh, such a patient with a low dose of thalidomide. Uh, we start for 100 milligrams, but we go down to 50 milligrams very quickly. That's our preferred regimen for this cohort of patients, above 75 frail patients, and we also lower the dose of melphalan very rapidly. Uh, I you? totally agree. I mean, the 75 is the cutoff for us at least, some people after 75, they may look fit, but the problem is that we, we have realized that in people that apparently don't have any comorbidity at all, all the uh, standards of uh, medical conditions seem to be okay. Still, once you start treating those patients very rapidly, we realize that they are actually older than 75. So. This might be a problem, and my option would be that certainly for MPT, not more than 100 milligrams, reducing it whenever necessary and being very careful with the dose of melphalan. So, some people might even be treated with VMP, but that's uh, def definitely with the not not more than the weekly uh, bortezomib. But my choice for those people would be MPT normally. I think the frailty definition uh, is based on uh, the geriatric assessment, but it's not very widely applicable. So for that reason, if a patient is independent and uh, can perform his daily activities, in that case, that patient deserves the best treatment. And for that purpose, uh, I, most centers in our country, they try to push towards the maximum treatment and VMP starting with bi-weekly and then continuing once weekly is an approach. And the traditional MPT is also another one. But these, um, the frailty can also be a cause of the disease itself. So it's, it's a kind of a balance. The, the benefit you achieve with the treatment will improve the performance status of the patient. And then you eventually are happy with the treatment that you're, you are choosing. Uh, in our Turkish MPT trial, the median age was 72. But there are many centers in our country who try to push with the transplant even when they are 75 years old. So the, the, the age cutoff, I think has been discussed a lot here, is, is a matter of subjectivity. And based on this factor, um, uh, even VMPT is another thing, and so try to give the maximum as possible is our approach. Well, in, in our center, we have indeed a team who make a geriatric assessment, and if we ask for it, uh, the question is at the end of the day, how so do you, you really... So you have a collaboration with the geriatric... Yes, uh, exactly, yes. Not for every patient, but especially for patients where we are not sure about which treatment to start, and. It's helpful in some aspects, uh, if it's only maybe about logistical uh, things, if you know the patient, will he or she be able to come for bortezomib every week or twice weekly. Um, so it's helpful, but we're learning what to do with these data. And in terms of which regimen we use, I think, uh, well, the studies you did have helped us enormously, and uh, in those patients above 75 years, we go for immediately for uh, bortezomib once weekly, and we follow the 
those modification guidelines for MPC? Okay, well, uh, I guess we are already some delay, so thank you everybody for the attention. We do have some coffee for 15 minutes uh, and we will start uh, again at 11. Thank you. <laughs>